It's now my particular pleasure to welcome our first keynote speaker, um, Professor Xiao Xinhuang, Michael Xiao, Xiao Xinhuang, is an extraordinary academic with a, a broad range of interests, touching on everything from Sino-Japanese relations, the rise of China in our region, um, marital issues and debates and discussions um, within Taiwan and, and um, and also the issues of democratization and the rise and fall of political strongmen and their significance um, for regional politics. Um, he's also worked broadly not only on Taiwan, but also in Hong Kong and Macau, all areas of great interest, in particular in the last year or so. Um, although uh, the professor will be speaking today about a, a topic to do with uh, the rise of the middle class and the new middle class and its impact on the democratization in post-war Taiwan, his broad interests, his um, vast publishing concerns, um, touch on all of these topics, and I hope during the Q&A, if we may, the Q&A session, some um, colleagues and friends would perhaps like to ask you about some of your other areas of interest as well, because you're so broadly informed and thought so widely on so many of the big topics and issues that so many participants in this conference are concerned with. Um, Professor Xiao is a, the, the director of the Institute of Sociology at the Academy of Seneca, an extraordinarily active and important institute. Um, he's also a distinguished research fellow with the Academy and professor of sociology at National Taiwan University and also at the National Sun Yat-sen University. Um, he's also the chair professor of Hakka studies at the National Central University. He's also had a political career serving as a national policy advisor to the government from 2000, uh, 1996 to 2006. So as I said, um, we're very fortunate to have a colleague here who has not only a vast a range of academic interests, but also policy engagement and also engagement with the big issues of the day, all concerns of this centre, a centre that tries to follow not only um, the questions of academic, international academic concern, but also those of pressing political and social concern for our contemporary world. So Professor Xiao, if I, I may, welcome you to give the first keynote address and to formally, through this keynote address, formally open this conference. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director Bami and Ambassador Yi, and distinguished guests. I'm very honored to be here, to be the first speaker for this conference. It is my fortune uh, to, uh, it's my fortune to be the first. Uh, Original was scheduled for uh, Minister Nong, uh, then she quit. Uh, <laughs> I didn't quit. I remain. Um, so I'm very pleased to hear that uh, the university, ANU, is one year older than me. The university was established in 1947, I was born in 1948. Um, and also I know the ANU has a good relation with National Taiwan and National Sen Yat-sen University. And I also has a fortune uh, to, to be uh, the faculty, um, faculty there. Um, uh, especially congratulations to uh, the uh, establish, establishment of the CIW. And I'm very pleased also, on uh, side note, that you organize this Taiwan views from the South. I'm just take a visa advantage to, proper, to say a few words about propaganda. Uh, we are organizing uh, a Taiwan study in the world. We call the World Congress of Taiwan Studies. And we held in 2012 in Academic Seneca, the first round of a World Congress. And the second Congress will be held in SOAS, London, uh, in this coming uh, June. So maybe we can call that Taiwan study view from the north. <laughs> so please fly to the north, and we will see what the difference or similarity between north and south. But Taiwan, only one, only one Taiwan. Um, OK, the, today's topic is I call it the oh, sorry. examining the role of a new middle class and the advocacy of civil society in Taiwan's post-war uh, democratization uh, experience. Um, I have a three uh, objectives, and I show, I'm sure uh, in the audience there are three kind of a person who want me to talk about something on Taiwan. One is pure academic. Who want to know about the, uh, the theories? 
What's the role of middle class and civil society and democracy? That's a more, more broader social, sciences, social science perspective, and I try to please you. The second one is to want to hear more about Taiwan stories, Taiwan democracy stories, so they're historical. So I will share with you what, ha what has happened in the last 50 years of Taiwan's democratization experiences. So I try to be a good a storyteller uh, to tell you about Taiwan history. The third one is try to, to actually more like advocacy, how we protect Taiwan democracy <laughs> once we have won, even though it's, an infant, it's infantile and new <coughs> democracy. So for those advocates, I will try to be on your side as well. So um, let me get into, uh, I have a 30 PowerPoint slides, and I have only 60 minutes. That means what? I have uh, two minutes for each PowerPoint. Each PowerPoint. So let's, let's go through that. Uh, first, to be theoretical. The current theorizing on the middle class, civil society, democracy, democracy link. So there are the triple links. How I try to untangle this, the three links and see what kind of link we can pursue to look at what, what civil, middle class, civil society, and democracy in the context, in, under, in the, the, in the context of Taiwan. The popular middle class of, of democracy has been very popular, especially all the way back to Positive Link by Aristotle, to Martin Lipset, to, to Bernard Moore, and all related to middle class has a lot to do Democracy. So slogan is like this, no, no middle class, no democracy. The negative link, of course, they talk about the, during the uh, Nazi German, they are the petty bourgeoisie, the, the middle class actually are very, very uh, ultra conservative, has uh, something to do with the rise of a Nazi. And during the uh, post-war, uh, also too, in the post-war US too. And that's what the uh, uh, Cyril Mills uh, even talk about Sir Mills talked about he, he put down, a, to, to put down the, the US mid, new middle class. Actually, he said the middle class is quite easily co opted, co -opted and, and possible demise, caused the demise of a democracy. But all in all, we got a positive, negative, or dubious relationship. All in all, the importance of the middle class in modern Western democracy was widely appreciated in, in the 1960s and still going on, still going on. The second is the popular civil society um, and democracy link, the second link. Again, the past link by Charles Taylor, Wazer, Cohen, Areto, and Putman, especially Robert Putman has a famous talk about social capital and association and uh, the democracy making and maintenance. And dubious link, the, the social, again, the social capital controversy. That's that you have a social capital doesn't mean you will be interested in promoting public good. You are only interested in your selfish pursuit by engaging in personal social capital. And organized voluntary association controversy as well. Local mafia, the very strong association, but that's is a society, but nothing to do with democracy. So those are dubious links too. And all in all, the role of a civil society has been celebrated in the late 1980s, since the fall of the Soviet Union and the Eastern European communism. So the civil society was an old concept, but a new meaning, especially since, in, since the 1980s. And so, especially now, the 80s, the, the third wave democratization has a lot to do with the rise of a civil society. And so the role of a civil society, such as in the form of an NGO, MPO, or social movement organization, had a lot to do with the, the making of the third wave democratization. Now, from what I have been observing for the last two, three decades, in Taiwan's case, I found something missing in the middle class democracy link, civil society democracy link. What was missing? The, the first link, the first missing is the lack of a two specificities of what middle class segment who actually have actively participate 
in which specific civil society organization that have direct relations to the making of democracy? Which middle class were we talking about? And what kind of a civil society we are talking about? Again, at what historical era, at which historical episode of democratization we are referring to the role of a middle class and also the, the contribution of a civil society organization. So we need to be more specific. And the best way to be more specific in the historical context is to put one country on a map and to look at Taiwan, which I know better. The historical era, historical phases of democratization, are we talking about initial stage, the initial liberalization, or the democratic transition and transformation? Or are we talking about the consolidation uh, phase, phase? Or we're talking about progressive or congressive term after democracy has taken place, once the ele electoral uh, politics is in its place? We have a regime change. It's a progressive term or, or conservative term uh, in the post-democratization phase. So in order to do that, I wanted to, to spend, spend a few minutes about how do we understand Taiwan's uh, middle class. That's a profile, Taiwan's middle class politically. The political propensity of the middle class as a whole um, how many middle classes in Taiwan? According to our empirical data, I think the subjective, subjective identification about 70%. But this is sub subjective identification. I am middle class. But you ask, what kind of middle class? Oh, I'm a lower middle class. Uh, and, and then uh, which segment? You know, I'm a professional. Oh, I'm a worker. Uh, I'm a white collar worker. Uh, so it, it's a mix. So 70% is a subjective ask. But we measure by objective in terms of the mode of production, which is more leftist term of uh, classification, or the barbarian term of uh, measuring occupation, occupation, income, education, and so on and so forth. Basically, we call about 30%. 30% of middle class in Taiwan. Uh, urban are higher than the ruler. Now, we are more interesting here is the political characteristics. You know, consumption is the basic. And uh, we have a study also uh, compared with uh, Taiwan uh, with in Asian Pacific. Basically, the Taiwan's middle class are the first generation middle class. Uh, they were the uh, product, the social product of the upgrade mobility. Their parents are uh, the farmers or working class. They were the major, the first, they are the first generation class. Middle, middle class, especially the new middle class. So there are three, so when we talk, talk about middle class, we are talking about three class segments. One is the old middle class. Oops, sorry, I pushed the wrong one. What's going on? To me, it's a high tech. Am I right with this? Okay, the, the old middle class, they basically is an entrepreneurial old class, the middle class who do business. And here we are not talking about big capitalists. We are not talking about big boss. We are talking about <coughs> or the small, medium entrepreneurs. They are old middle class. The new middle class are the professional, professional managerial class who are white color huh? to be shi zi bei, shi. 工程师, engineer, 老师, teachers, 建筑师, architect, 还有什么师,会计师,还有医师,所以我们叫师自备的, 都是 new middle class, 我们也是 new middle class, 我们是老师. Now the other one is marginal middle class, who are in between the white color and blue color, who are those people, salesmen or sales lady. Uh, and then the typical case is the, for the sales, on the insurance, and then uh, the who sell uh, the Gui Tai Xiaojie, the typical marginal middle class. Marginal middle class. Um, they feel they we did a survey. They strongly feel we, I am middle class, but their salary is very close to the the blue colors. So there are the three segment. So we have to ask ourselves, 
which middle cloud we are referring to when we try to analyze the three triple, the, the, the triple link. The other one is, uh, what are the political characteristics? Here is tricky. When we talk about the middle class as a whole, it's one thing. And also different, also it's a, another thing is when we're talking about the old middle class, or we're talking about new middle class, or you talk about marginal middle class in terms of their political uh, inclination or political behaviors or but their political orientations. So, but all in all, first let's talk about all in all middle class character. It's dual political inclination. We always found the coexistence of the liberalism. They want to change. They feel, they think, things should be better and can be better because they make, they make better. They are the middle class, they are the first generation middle class. So I'm better than my parents. So I'm, I think the society can be better uh, through our effort. On the other hand, they are conservative, all in all, or two, because they want to keep whatever they want, they can. So retain what they have. Also, they are really reluctant to push too far. So in a way, they are 走一步退两步, you know, one or two foot, two feet ahead and one foot backward. And then they will watch, they are very watchful to depend on, is it allowed, it's okay now? You know, if things are okay, no, I'm very courageous. If it is uh, dangerous, then you go first. <laughs> so this is the kind of a, a, a middle class um, dubious, dubious characteristic. But, but with, if, here I wanted to highlight uh, the position. So this is, is a, a kind of a, 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 a all in all uh, characteristics. My proposition to look at it, this the middle class one is the, the specific liberal and progressive element of the new middle class who can be documented to be the major force behind Taiwan's post-war democratization experience. So I have a layout my analytical angle, not all middle classes. I'm trying to specify the liberal, pro-democratic, progressive, new middle class intellectuals who has played the role in Taiwan democracy. Now, second, let's look at the service of the profile, characterizing Taiwan civil society activism. Um, how many civil society organizing CSO in Taiwan? Uh, according to the record, about 40,000. It's not a big number. It's a one. About 40,000 registered. Uh, registered, I want to emphasize. Uh, 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 Peter Berger, I, I, my, uh, my senior colleague of, uh, of uh, American sociology, he said, what is a civil society organization? Check the yellow page. Register, you know. Uh, 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 under the category association, NGO, NPO, they are the civil society. Yes. We have registered about 40,000. You can look into those civil society organizations in terms of their objectives or the purposes or uh, the, the goals. And one is uh, uh, service, philanthropic. Second one, advocacy. The third one is community. This is the percentage of distribution are uh, not scientific at all. I haven't done, we, we, we fail many times to do the population survey of, uh, of Taiwan's CSO, they always get 20% return. So that means what, they're active, probably 20%. The other are bubble. The other bubble, civil, civil society. But the important thing, 20% make the history. The 80% doesn't matter. You know? <laughs> and the other one is look at the typology of the organization. Uh, the other one is association. Is a membership based. Membership Association. The other one is a foundation, is in endowment based. The this is a this is a uh, accurate number. Uh, uh, thirty-five thousand is association. Ten percent there's a record on foundation, about five five thousand. Foundations. Now, if you look at it, 90% are belong to the do good things or do nice things, service, philanthropical. 
、慈善、服务型、福利型 ，those foundation those those association and foundations. Of course, the typical one, the famous one, is the Ciji, right? And we have association like a lot, uh, 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 很多慈善团体 that those belong to the、uh, service philanthropical. Now the community one is about five percent, and the advocacy about five percent.、Uh, advocacy is what I try to focus. Community 很有名的，新港基金会。还有呃，仰山基金会，宜兰、新港在嘉义的新港，啊、uh, ，and then among many many, you we try to、uh, look at that,、uh, them individually. Ah,、uh, so we are talking about forty thousand. So here is what is my proposition. Ah,、uh, the features important. Ah,、uh, new since nineteen eighties, seventy five percent of the forty thousand foundation association were have were established. After 1980, and that is the era. That is the golden age of 1980s, the rise of free association. Even though when before lived the martial law, so 80s are the new era for CSO. Second, small, medium in size. They are very humble in finance. They are quite poor. 其实很穷，没什么钱，但是呢。Bold and comprehensive in ambition, 志气很大，所以小而美啊，但是志气很大。I look at all this interview with them. They are real. I want to do this and that, but do you have money? No.、Um, how to do it? Raise the money. See,、uh, surprisingly, because、uh, they are locally initiated, they are locally initiated and funded. Not by UN because since 1971, Taiwan was expelled from UN or withdrew from UN. So we didn't get any penny from UN, UNESCO, or World Bank. See, as you know, the third world. Every year, every decade,、uh, UN will launch the decade of development, decade of women, decade of children, decade of environment, decade of people. Then all the, the mushrooming of our association emerged just to get the UN money. Taiwan, no money, no penny from the. So it's locally. But if you look at as I would dis- dem- demonstrate with to you, we got everything. We got every in every uh, 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 CSO from a children, women, environment, human rights, peace, you name it. We got it. So how to do it? Not by UN funding. Not by through intellectual communication. So and also、uh, with two response. Taiwan's domestic need. Okay, so from goodwill to reform consciousness, ran wide range of CSOs, and rise of regional as well as functional networking within Taiwan. So we got a Taipei Association or Taipei Union of a Social Welfare Association. We got a Tai Gao Xiong, so regional、uh, association, and also functional. A woman associate, woman foundation, woman、uh, a social movement. They can link together as a networking, and there are also Taiwan's、uh, NGOs, NPO are quite global, quite global. They especially, I just name a、uh, three woman issue. Taiwan's uh, 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 the Garden、uh, Garden of Eve、uh, Foundation, Li Xin, has been very ambitious. To reach to the Asian、uh, Women's Foundation、uh, Association to protect the teen prostitutes and and the human trafficking and Taiwan's Aborigines Association's foundation has been very very daring to develop a Asian alliance of、uh, Aborigines, the indigenous peoples and environment. Taiwan is part of very strong no nook. Association alliance in Asia. So in a way, it's re- in a way it's quite global reach, and and of course, every time Taiwan wanted to join, Taiwan NGO NPO wanted to go to、uh, UN, always blocked. And they say you, this is very funny. I found very、uh, hypocritic of the UN.、Uh, this is a UN gathering, and and Taiwan's NGO, Taiwan's non-governmental is non. Governmental, very clearly, but they all say you are governmental. <laughs> you know, very, very interesting. So, so sometimes t 
Taiwan's uh, an NGO has to use the members' pass foreign passport to go into the UN to uh, join the UN gatherings. So it's very ironic, you know. And so, so it's a global reach. Now, according to our survey too, the most of the the foundation association we have we have surveyed, they all claim they are they are autonomous. This is a basic principle, the first ingredients to be civil society, to be autonomy, and Taiwan has made it. So we are not part of a government apparatus. We are not under the control of a government. So which now the survey was by two, some 2000 uh, uh, in, in year 2000. But advocacy is less. She said, yes, we try to be advocate on this issue and that issue. And also from uh, after the 1980, we also see some service philanthropic association foundation has become more vocal, that become more daring to, to tackle, to criticize the policies. And some um, advocacy social movement organization in the 1980s, especially uh, after the martial law, they also become more service oriented. They, I want to do some good thing, nice thing too. If you look at this one, uh, service philanthropic, basically all these 36,000 uh, organization, and I try very hard to do nice, to, be, to, be, to do nice things, and advocacy to do critical things, and community to do good things to the community, from educating, cultural activities, set up a library, and help the uh, needed elderly in the community, and so on and so forth. So they both are very important, to do good things, to do nice things, and to do critical things. And Taiwan has all. OK, now, my proposition, how we look at this. This is good to have a separate lecture about civil society. Many stories can be told. I'm editing the two volumes of called Taiwan's uh, 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 third sector history, or the history of Taiwan's third sector. We also include uh, several advocacy NGOs and community NGOs and uh, service NGO, and to ask them to write their histories. So the first volume about 14 NGOs, and the second volume uh, it has 11 NGOs. So we have uh, 25 histories of NGOs and civil society, and they all came out very interesting. Uh, uh, the history, I think, is, 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 is representing of Taiwan, grassrooted, democratic in nature. My proposition in this talk is this. The, it is the advocacy civil society organization that can be, that have been documented to be the primary force to push for Taiwan democratic transition in the post-war era. So I will now look at the service philanthropic, nor this, uh, the community one. I will focus on the advocacy one, because my, another, my, my reading of the civil society organization is the advocacy civil society has played a role in Taiwan's democratization. OK, the third, the third one is how we periodizing Taiwan's five decades of democratization. Um, I will look from the, from the talk to follow. The first is the beginning of the intellectual ferment, 1960. We will start with 1960. And that's coincide with the, the, uh, the, 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 photo, uh, the photo exhibit, 1950s, 60s. Of course, there's no civil society there, but there's society there. Uh, the second is a cultural identity awareness and the political criticism and the rise of a Dang Wan political force in 1970s. The third phase is the social protest movement and the establishment of the first opposition party, DPP. That's it. That was the 1980s. And also the political constitutional reform and the sustained uh, support from civil society in 1990s. And the fifth, the first democratic regime change under DPP, 2000 and 2008. And then number six, we will also examine the uh, during the phase they call conservative turn in post democratization period under KMT 
2008 and 2014, and what civil society and also the critical uh, new middle class element has played the role in the six phases of democratization experiences. Okay, let's look at this. Is a, this is this all the material gathered from the, from various sources by historian, by the archive. You are familiar with those names, but you might you sometimes might forget it. But let's look at the 1960s. They are not necessarily from the first generation middle class, but they are the middle class. They are the intellectuals, reform-minded intellectuals in the 60s. And some of them are Menendez. Okay, let's look at this one, 1960. the they're advocating freedom of uh, forming opposition party. They're already demanding for the, free, the freedom to establish a, a opposition party. And then 1957 to 1965, Wenxin Zhazi, those are my high school era, my high school period to read those magazines, <coughs> Enlightenment. So I read, I still remember when I was a first year of college, I traced back the old issue. They even uh, introduced the Taco Parsons, you know? So very interesting, uh, of course, Sate and the feminism, you know. So this is, has an interesting enlightenment among the youngsters. Uh, in Haiguang, I remember in, back in the uh, university, first year, I attended several his lectures. They are at that time. And then 1964 is very important, this one I wanted to highlight this one, Taiwan Renmin Dong, the self-rescue declaration of Taiwan. One, tai one China, one Taiwan. New constitution, protection of a human right, democratic political system, rejoin the UN. And that time, look at it, demo demo dem demographic number. <coughs> so that was the first time in 1964, 12 million Taiwanese, the people de decide the, the, the future of Taiwan. And you will look at later, I also try to trace 1,700 and then you know. So this mission had never achieved, not yet. They, Peng, that's uh, Professor Peng and his two students. And I think two, last year, they celebrate or commemorate the, the uh, 50 years of the decoration and they have a seminar conference there. Uh, what's a very daring, 1964. Huh? So let's not forget, democracy could and can be started very early. It did not succeed, doesn't, doesn't mean it, did not, it was not there. We have to really pay the tribute uh, to the history of democracy. And Rise of Dangwai, 1969, outside the KMT party. The Dangwai is a very creative term because you cannot have a new part, the party, so therefore, I am outside the party. So, <laughs> so it's just think it's the, the, the origin of Dangwai, just I think very interesting. They team up together to attract thousands of supporters in the campaign rally, a very significant social and political phenomenon under martial law. 69, of course, under martial law and political reform, consciousness raising. And Dang Wei Minzu Yin Dong, the Xin Qi, and then elections. And those people are some are still alive. Huang Xinjie already died. Kang Ning Xiang just published his memoir with 700 pages, I think. Uh, Huang Tianfu, and Dang Wei Yi Zi, the Chu Xie. So in the 60s, almost forgotten. But I think we have to renew our memories. And now, 70s, again. Here, remember, I'm not highlighting individuals, but again, in 1960s, the significance of individuals, but let's not forget, they all have a journals, magazines, newspapers, intellectuals. So, So I think at that time, you can see in Taiwan, not just individuals cry out loud in the street. They issue, they write papers, they write column, they use newspapers and 
And then that tradition continues in the 70s. You have the the intellectual magazine. You see the names are liberals. Uh, the liberal Chen Guoying, Zhang Junhong, Chen Shaoting, Qiu Hongda, Hu Fo, Yang Guoshu, Wang Xiaopo, among others. And we can document the names. Uh, and also 1975, and then Da Xue Zhao stopped, and then Taiwan Zhen Ren show light on the five issues. The political review magazine, again by, uh, by some of the overlap one, but still uh, Huang Xinjie, Kang Ningxiang, Zhang Junhong, Yao Jiawen, Zhang Jinche, Huang Hua, Qiu Cui Liang. Go Yixing, Chiu Cui Lang is in, uh, in Queensland. Huh? Uh, and then the Taiwan Party Review, Criticism of Authoritarian System. And then Xiang Tu Wen Xue Dong. Most of uh, only literary people, are, uh, but as, as a social scientist, I think it's very important to place the Xiang Tu Wen Xue Dong and the Ming Ge Yun Dong in the social movement. Because that was a, sort of the first time to bring Taiwan society, culture into our mindset. They say, this is our land. We should respect, we should love. And so the Xiangzhu Wen Xue Yun Dong, at that time, if you look at our document, they say, all the novels, you know, I remember, I worked with, uh, uh, with uh, Bo Yang, very senior, he died already. At one time in 19, late 80 or 90, we, we, we in, the, in, the, in the seminar and we document, we look at all the popular, the best sellers in the 50s, 60s and 70s. And none of the book, none of the novel has anything to do with Taiwan. Either, either is an, uh, 再见中旅, 再见中旅 in California, the, the, the 留学生, or Zhang Aijia, Shanghai, or uh, Wang Lan, the Xinjiang月亮太阳, uh, 在重庆,还是北京,要不然就是博洋自己的,在打交匪,在这个月,在应该在金三角。There's no Taiwan, but we read, we read, we read all the time, but nothing to do with Taiwan. So that's, that's why Xiangtu Wenxue Yun Dong, they say, we should have a novel, we should have a literature of Taiwan, about Taiwan. So that's why Xiangtu Wenxue Yun Dong started, of course. It was a debate by conservative writers said this is Lang Lai La, Lang Lai La. And then this is Hui Se Wen Xue, this is Gongtan Wen Xue, this is Zuo Yi Wen Xue. But the, the, the battle was over in the late 70s. The, this real, the social realism of literature was established ever since. And then because of the Xiang Tu Wen Xue, then we can see the Xin Dian Yi, the new movies, Sayonara Zai Jian. <coughs> Uh, walking, walking man, so that we can that be that that all the movie is about Taiwan. And then song, you know, the guitar, guitar and very simple melodies to singing Wai Po the Pong Huan. Nothing to do with uh, 我爱你, 你爱我, 然后美酒, 美酒加咖啡, 或者是, 咖啡加美酒, 或者是父亲的人, 父亲的人, uh, but that is simple social life. So this, I, I think, to me, is a very important uh, 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 sort of a enlightenment, another kind of enlightenment. It's not foreign enlightenment, it's local. See, locality, the local culture need to brought in to enlighten us, to remind us, this is our land, this is our people, this is our culture, this is our history. So through novels, through Sanwen, Xiao Shuo, and movies. So that's why 80s and 90s, the Xin Dian uh, caught a lot of attention. Okay, now in 1977, here again, that's another uh, uh, Presbyterian church, very significant, I will, I will uh, uh, which is very important. Taiwan Presbyterian Church issue human rights declaration call for making Taiwan a new and independent country to face increasing threat of annexation from PRC. And then slogan was, again, in how many years? 13 years, our population increased by 5 million. Uh, so 5 more million to decide his own fate. 
啊，一千七百万人决定台湾前途啊，这个这个 ministers。So it's important to look at this as well. And then 1979, very important thing. I think、um, all of us are still remember this Formosa incidents. And before that, in 1977, the Zhongli incident, because the election irregularity、uh, in Zhongli,、uh, they were they were. Block the、uh, the police station, and that、uh, Xu Xinliang、uh, ran ran for uh, uh, ran for uh, 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 mayor uh, magistrate of、uh, Taoyuan. See, so okay, now、uh, this is a human right. This was a human right rally, and again during the rally,、uh, during during the rally,、uh, it, it's called the Gao Xiong Incident. Ah, and here I want to focus on this.、Uh, Uh, they even the Dang Wai at that in 1970 in that year very important. Besides the besides this uh, uh, Formosa incidents, besides the Zhongli incident, also that time the Dang Wai become very Dang Wai alliance become active. They even organized the Dang Wai National Affair Conference, Dang Wai, Guo Shi Hui Yi, and they also、uh, call for the determination. Of Taiwan future by the Taiwanese, that everyone living in Taiwan is、uh, Taiwanese to determine our own future.、Uh, so, and then important this Dang Wai, this is the here I put I didn't put a name. We call Medi Dao Shi Dai, or for、uh, Formosa generations. They are in their late sixties or early seventies. They are. And then more important is because of the Formosa incident, there are another new defending lawyer generation: Chen Shui-bian, Xie Changting, Yu Qing, Jiang Pengjian, Su Zhengchang, Zhang Junxiong, Li Sheng, Li Shengxiong, and Guo Jiyan, and among other, so on and so forth. They are defending lawyers, and they still play active role even in today's Taiwan's politics. So here again, so far by the. 1980s. All the names on the list are the liberal intellectuals, 师资辈的人 lawyers, professors, intellectuals. So that's why. But they are not necessarily reflecting the so-called new middle class out of the 1980s. Let's look into the 1980s. As a social, as a sociology who has been working on Taiwan social movement. I have paid a very a close attention on Taiwan's social movement since 1980s. I went back to Taiwan after my graduate study in 1979, and so I have it as a witness of Taiwan's social movement. Now let's look at the first. I call the first wave, that between 1980s to 1986. Let's remind you, it's still under the martial law. The first important. Uh, rise of the Consumer Foundation, 1980s November 1st, Consumer Foundation of Taiwan, and the key members are architects, lawyers, accountant, professors, and、uh, those are other people. They are typical. So in 1980s, we can see as as you you follow uh, 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 my uh, uh, my analysis, you will see. Most of the key persons are really what we characterize the advocate、uh, advocates reform new middle classes elements. The second one is the anti pollution protest movement in various localities due to the due to the pollution problems. So in very locality, they have a self help、um, self help anti pollution association. And it's the old social fabric also play a very important role、uh, to support the victims. So it's a typical victims movement. And this one, Consumer Foundation, basically is an agent movement.、Uh, they are the people who actually can escape from the pollution, the the environmental problem. But they are the middle class who advocates for the consumer right. And I was one of the、uh, member in the establishment of the Consumer Foundation. And then in 1982, the nature conservation movement, the the, the we call the they call wildlife、uh, nature conservation、uh, union. And here I want to remind you that to、uh, this is 1980 to 86 established, but you can see it continued. So you can see the movement still still going on. 
until today. Uh, they have more organization established. So well, I would say the initiation was in 1980s. And then women's movement, Fu Li Xin Zhi, the Awakening Foundation. And then the Aboriginal Human Rights Movement, Taiwan Yuan Zhu Ming, Chu Jing Hui, Aboriginal Human Rights Advancement uh, Promotion, uh, Advancement Association. And the student movement, 1986, start with National Taiwan University. The student uh, leaders, the uh, the, uh, the, the student union, they demand for direct election. You know, before, 19, before that time, the student union, the president of the student union was indirectly elected. So they demand, first, very simple, they just want direct election of the NSR of the National Taiwan University. And later you will see, in 1990s, they come, they, they walk outside the war of the university to demand for the abolishment of the National Assembly in four years. Now students are the reserve army of the future new middle class. So I will put them together here too. And, uh, and, and then the student move. And then this one, the New Testament church protest, they're demanding for the freedom of religious freedom. And Xin Yue Jiao Hui. And then the student movement. And then they promoted to the Da Xue Gai Ge Chu Jing Hui. And then here, in 1986, uh, September 28, uh, the establishment of DPP uh, uh, is illegally established. And here the name you can see. So don't just look at the uh, um, association, they are individuals. The component, most of so far, except this one, the, the victim associations are the local residents across different classes. Ruler, farmers, workers, local residents. But again, even this one, anti pollution protest movement, received a lot of support from a new middle class journalist who came there, and the students, university students, and then professors, and who supported, write articles to support the anti pollution uh, movement. And you can see all the, and then this one, Aboriginal Human Rights Association are the young intellectuals, Aboriginal intellectuals who study in Taipei. And uh, they work in Taipei and they feel their culture has been lost. So uh, they kind of self awareness to, to do, and so they all belong to the new middle classes. Let's look at it, wave, uh, wave two. Uh, that's in that year. If I'm a historian, I really wanted to look at it, 1987, the year, from January 1st to December 31st. You know, I, I think that somebody wrote, Wan Li, San I think, by a historian. I think 1987 was the so social scientist. It was a very interesting year. Just before, before the lift of martial law and right after the lift of martial law. And here I want to put it, before 1987, what happened in 1986? DPP was established illegally. Secondly, uh, uh, Jiang, Kai uh, Jiang Jingguo, uh, after in, during his, his meeting with Mrs. Graham, Martha Graham, I think Mar Margaret Graham, uh, the, the publisher of the, uh, uh, Catherine Graham, Catherine Graham, and he said, we are about to lift the martial law. And also during the Zhong Chang Hui, uh, he talked about San Bian, three changes. So give the signal that martial law will be lifted. Now what make him to do that? I think, of course, the, the rise of opposition and he decided not to expel, he not to suppress the DPP. He has his own reason, which I think is a smart idea. And I knew during the time in the late 86, a lot of conservatives still, you should crack down the, the DPP, but he decided not to. And, and also, so I think what he has seen is the Taiwan society has changed and make him change too. So I think that's why it's a link between, so here I think it's important, I put here the lift of martial law 87. But here during the year, we got the labor movement, 87. The first strike was by Yuan Dong Fang Zhi Gong Si, Yuan Fang, and the Lao Gong Fa, Lao Zi Hui. 
This is a working class or a, a union. But this Lao Zihui, the, now they changed the name, new name called Labor Front. Very important are lawyers, labor lawyers, professors who study law, who study labor issues. And then uh, Farmers Association 87, Teachers Human Rights Movement, the Handicapped and Disadvantaged Welfare Protest Movement, Handicapped Union, and also established the Lao Ren Fu Li Lian Mong, Elderly Welfare Alliance. And the legendary figure was Liu Xia, a female handicapped uh, poet and writer, Liu Xin Lin Zi, that's her uh, pen name, right name. Yeah. And then political prisoners of human rights movement and the truth and the truth for 2000, 22A incident movement, 87, Taiwan Ren Quan Su Jing Hui, Taiwan Human Rights Association. And then here is interesting, Mainland Home Visiting Movement, Wai Shan Ren Fan Xiang Su Jing Hui. Very interesting. Every time the rally during the 80, mid, uh, uh, early 80, he always went to the rally and wear the white, uh, white cape. And say, Sao Xiao Li Jia Lao Da Huan, Fan Xiang Yu Zui Ma. Very touching, very touching. And, and, then, and, then, and then veterans benefit protest, Lao Bing Fu Li Yun Dong, basically to demand to cash in uh, the Shou Tian Zheng uh, land deed. Uh, and cash in. But the day the day the government decided to cash in, but with a high cost. If the if first time in 1987 uh, was cashing much, much cheaper. Uh, and later, you know, postpone the time, more price go up, so I think they demand more. So, so it's interesting. Um, there also the Zheng Nanlong, Zi Fen, and that's demonstration, demonstration for, demonstration for freedom of speech and Taiwan independence, Zheng Nanlong. That's a, again, uh, that act, to tell the truth, Inspire a lot, quite a few, quite a few uh, uh, Taiwanese who uh, has a strong independent mind, uh, but not well documented, though. So it's very, very nice. So that year, again, all those people, very much uh, cross either cross class or the major, the the, the 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 primary supporter are the intellectual, uh, liberal intellectual lawyers, and so on and so forth. Now, let's look at the 1978, uh, uh, yeah, and then, okay. And then in 1988 to the third wave, uh, we have the following, uh, following um, movement, um, education reform movement, Renben Ji Jing Hui, and Zhao Gai Lian and also Blacklist Taiwanese Home Returning Movement, Hei uh, Mingdan, Taiwan Renmin Fan Xiang, Taiwan Ren Fan Xiang, Su Jing Hui, and the Political Prisoners Human Rights Association, and the Hakka Ethnic Language and Cultural Movement, the Anti Nuclear Movement, the Non Home Owner, the, uh, the Wu Ke Guanyu, uh, the Non Home Owner, who can afford to buy a new home due to the escalating of the, rent, uh, of the real estate price. And then just uh, last year, during the election, they hold uh, from a non-share movement, they called having a nest movement. Yo Chao. They, they wish they wanted to demand a nest. And so, so that is, a, uh, again, another one. And judicial reform movement, uh, very much so by civic judicial reform movement, by lawyers, and so on and so forth. And to journalist autonomy movement, and then white lotus, 1990s, a very, very famous one, Wild Wild Lily. And the intellectual anti-military interference in politics demonstration 1990s. And that time was uh, because the uh, president didn't want nominate uh, Hao Bochun, is to be the prime minister. So many, many professor intellectuals are sitting in front of the Xin Gong Yuan in the uh, 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 Bo So, So this one, the left, the, deep, the martial law, and the Li Deng, during the Li Deng Hui, uh, lived on ban on press, and also lived on ban on political parties. So you can see the in historical sequence, government responded to the demand from the new middle classes, join in the civic organizations, 
pro-democracy civil society organizations. Let's look at the 1990s. The political and constitutional reform and the sustained support from, uh, from a civil society. I think I have to go, I think I, my time is, uh, uh, I have to fast, uh, go fast. Right in the one liberal uh, per, uh, professors and collectively restore their KMT party membership. There are 28 professors. And then uh, this is important to uh, uh, anti-nuclear, the first big rally. And also this one is also important, Action 100 Alliance, uh, to the abolish, abolishment of Article 100 of the Criminal Code of Freedom of Speech. Uh, those are professors, Ta uh, Taiwan, Taiwan Professor Union, uh, quite important and has been very play a very important role. And then it's only Tai and plus the so uh, led by uh, Lin Yixiong. Okay. And and all, okay, uh, going on in 1994, the educational reform march by uh, Taiwan NTU mathematics professor Huang Wuxiong. And then the, the 1994, the Taiwan Xinwen Jizhe the Taiwan Journalist Association was established and also demand for the internal freedom of press and professionalism. And then there's a, so, a social legislation act coalition by many social uh, uh, welfare associations. And then the one that will rally say no to China rally uh, by, led by Presbyterian Church and many social movement organizations. And then during the mid 1990s in the world, all the social movement, advocacy, so civil society has three, four terms. One is go to community more, and then to professional. They, they demand the professional reform within medical profession, within profession, uh, within journalists, within service sector, and so on. And then networking, going to, to a netizen. Uh, movement and then uh, peripheral going to outside of Taipei. Okay, the first, then we go into the 2000 and 2008. Advocacy civil society, that's the first regime change. Advocacy civil society organization and activists under the first regime change under DPP 2000 and 2004, uh, they were the formal allies. And the first two years was a honeymoon period, wait and see. And then later become very disappointment on the part of uh, uh, advocacy civil society organization, especially in labor, welfare, and environment. And they even criticized the DPP government for betraying uh, their promises and moral, and moral uh, uh, in integrity. Uh, and also, and the, the civil society organization was very upset about the DPP's inaction on the transitional justice. And so the authoritarian legacy remained during the time. And civil society organization for the second term, uh, for the DPP's second term, little achievement were made on significant reform agenda as opposition KMT blocked nearly all reform initiative in LY. DPP administration failed to break and political deadlock. DPP government even took a rather conservative position in facing political oppositions. So the civil society, the new middle class, and the DPP develop a kind of a love and hate a feeling uh, and by the end election, they might still cast a vote for, to, for DPP. But during before, and they were very upset and frustrated. And advocates, adv ac activists and advocates for many social movements even criticized DPP, as I mentioned, betray a moral com commitment and campaign promises. But I still want to say that during the eight years, um, the procedure of democratic cons consolidation and deepening, such as the protest of a freedom of a speech and association, will still safeguard uh, between 2000 and 2008. But no progressive reform was ever initiated. A sense of a collective anger from a civil society activists at this a scandalous 
uh, misconduct of a Chen family. Uh, just for your information, Chen Shui-bei was released yesterday <laughs> afternoon uh, for a medical parole uh, for one month. And DPP government did try it again. In its later years, the necessary public trust and support in promoting and enacting reform much desired and desired and sought by the social movement, but all came too late to save its political survival in 2008 presidential election. Interesting, odd enough to note that the KMT remained conservative and even reactionary to many of the civil society progressive call for social and political reform during its entire eight years period of opposition. That was the first time for KMT to be in the opposition. But according to a mature democratic system, opposition uh, is supposed to develop a kind of a coalition and alliance with the civil society organization. But at that eight years, very little or near to zero. And there's no coalition be, co alliance between the civil society organization a social movement, uh, you name it. I remember it's only one time that the, the KMT supported social movement was the Farmers Association's protest <laughs> against uh, the reform of the Farmers Association because the government that time wanted to uh, sort of reform the Xinyongbu, the credit department, because they, the credit department would become a, a sales, you know, credit, and so they want to they wanted crack down this one. but. DPP support that they should keep the single move. Uh, that was the first time. And I, I have an interview with the environmental group, labor group, and uh, welfare group. And they told me they have a hard time in developing any constructive relations with the, with the KMT at that time, the foundations then. Um, they said, we don't have a trust between us. Uh, I think DPP doesn't like the social movement, and social movement leaders doesn't like KMT either. So, so this is what happened. Uh, no mutual trust was restored or developed between the two formal rivals. So you can see civil society, the advocacy civil society, tried very hard to be independent. They criticized DPP for being betrayal to their campaign promise and a moral judgment, moral commitment. They also still consider KMT has no um, position in a position to initiate any reform. So what happened after 2008? Civil society organization in 2008 uh, under the second regime change under the KMT regain rule further frustrated and resentful toward Mao's right-wing neo-authoritarian rule for his, for his conservative uh, uh, policies. Ma administration was criticized by civil society organization uh, for its neoliberal economic and social policy by legalizing casinos, trimming the national pension system, and acquiring farmland from, for industrial protests during the pa past few years. Insisting on nuclear energy, energy development policy, and uh, also quite regressive uh, various general environmental costs. And so therefore, what happened? Many new, I would call it a resurrection, a resurrection of a civil society movement and activists in 2008 and 2014, new movement in the rise. CCW, there was a new in 2007, it's called Citizen Congress Watch was established and by 30 social movement organizations. An encouragement move in democratic consolidation. A remobilization on the march again of more than 10 key social movement organizations beginning in late 2008. So right after the KMT regained its power, the social movement reassembled again to, they found the energies again somehow. Um, the resilience of a pro-democracy spirit of the progressive civil society movement somehow still alive. And here is 2008, you can see another one called Wild Lily, a uh, Wild Strawberry, Ye Chao Mei. And there was a student and youngsters protest against the, the visit of a Chen Ming Ling 
uh, the, so many civil society organizations, they think it's uh, improper for the government to, uh, to, to stage the uh, un unproportionally protection of the uh, China envoy and, and even told the public not to hand the national flag near the hotel of Yuan San Fan Dian. They think it's not right. And also, in and, and 2013, again, you know, the white shirt rally, Bai uh, San Jun, they were uh, protested by the, uh, led by the citizen 1985, uh, September 2013, to protest against the torture death of the young soldier, uh, Hong Zhongqiu, in the army camp. And then you can see more, the Taiwan ruler from Taiwan Longchen Zhenxian, uh, to protest, to protest and to protect Taiwan's uh, farmers and livelihood and, and, again, and also the land. And the Citizen Alliance for Monitoring Cross-Strait Liang Dumeng, uh, Cross-Strait Negotiation and, uh, and uh, Agreement to safeguard Taiwan's uh, uh, national interest and the national integrity targeting China's dominance and Taiwan Democracy Watch uh, Taiwan Minzu Ping Tai, that's another new intellectual uh, organization, to safeguard to Taiwan's democratic system from collapse and to facilitate Taiwan democratic consolidation targeting China's interference. So again, later part from internal to external, from uh, 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 Taiwan democratization and also to save Taiwan democratization, even though Taiwan democracy only very uh, short period of time. And then we go to, uh, you are familiar with Fan Yiba 318. Here I, uh, I'll read it. 318 Sunflower Civic, Organize, Civic Movement. I deliberately did not to call it student movement, as I will explain to you later. March 18, it was an occupied legislator, legislative yen to rescue Taiwan's democracy and protest Taiwan, protect Taiwan's national interest integrity in the face of China's political threat and economic pressure targeting at China's influence. 318 Sunflower Civic Movement demonstrated the effectiveness of the further mobilization of all advocacy-oriented civil society organizations to join and to sustain the movement, and I'll explain why. The student was inside the LY, but important thing is outside for that March 18 to April 10, day and night. There are many, many citizens. Most of them are middle classes. Parents, young generations, who work all day and then went there to support. Wanting along to show their support by being there. And the more important thing is, a lot of them are the first timer on the street. They were touched by those students. And then, important in, my, in the context of my talk, the core civil society organization. There are many organizations I named already in the previous uh, slides. Um, they were there, stationed there, to support the student, to safeguard the student, to protest, you know, to protect the students inside the LY. And they even organize, uh, give consultations, or even provide spaces or financial support or uh, get, get some money to support the student. Which are those organizations? Taiwan Association, Taiwan Association of University Professors, Tai Jiao Shou Lian Meng, Awakening Foundation, Fu Li Xin Zhi, Taiwan Association for Human Rights, Taiwan Ren Qian Xie Hui, Citizen Congress Wall, CCW, Gong Du Meng, Taiwan Labor Fund, Lao Zhen, Taiwan Ruler Fund, Taiwan Nong Zhen, Earth Citizen Foundation, Gongming, uh, uh, Gong and Citizen 1985, led many by medical doctors and then experts in communications. And then and Green Citizen Action Alliance, Taiwan Democracy from Democracy Watch, Taiwan Alliance for Advancement of Youth Right at Qing uh, uh, Sao and Black Island. Youth, Hei Dao Qing. The peripheral CSOS, CSOS involved also in alliance for referendum, Gong Tou Meng, 
Taiwan International Workers Association, 国际劳劳工协会，劳基协会 ，Taiwan Alliance for the Victim of Urban Renewal, 都市更新受害者协会 ，Alliance for Workers of Close Close Factory, 官场联盟，受害搞劳工 ，Win of a Radical Party, and those are the by a young sociologist who has been observing during the days and to document and Albert Albert Zen. So that's why it's not the student movement alone, but the key member, yes, the student one who initiated. But even before night, uh, March 18, they were consulted by some liberal intellectuals, right? critical intellectuals. So these are the, by, we can look at it, 60, 70, 80, 90. You had a real name. You got a real organization. So that's come to my conclusions. I think time is pretty much closed. Clarification. There are real pro-democracy individuals, such as liberal intellectuals and activists, and organizations in civil society have been indispensable in the democracy-making history of Taiwan over the past five decades. Number two, the history of making democracy in Taiwan is full of struggles confrontations and contentions between the democratic force in the civil society and the political opposition on the other, on the other hand, and the conservative <coughs> KMT on the other. 30 years ago, it was like that. 30 years later, still, they, they, they still are the, on, the, uh, on the confrontational side. Number three, with or without, with or without proper or conducive political opportunities, the liberal intellectuals, 60s, 70s, and advocacy social movement since 1980s, and the political opposition have constituted the driving force and change agent behind the five decade history of democratic struggles, either to push for democratization during 1960 and 2000, 2000 and to rescue the democracy in the, in the face of a China pressure. That's in 2008 and 2014. Ta number four, Taiwan experience in democratization over the past five decades confirms the positive link among middle class, civil society, and democracy making. Number five, Taiwan's case also highlights the critical issue of examining, we have to issue, we have to examine the specificity of the middle classes and the civil society organization at the different historical juncture of the politics of democratic struggles. Number six, this is important. Taiwan experience also has further demonstrated that the progressive new middle class individuals and groups has initiated or involved in advocacy and social movement oriented civil society organization needed to one, to push collectively for initiate, initial liberalization and they might end up in jail. To safeguard the necess necessary dem democratic transition since 1980s and, and to deepen democratic consolidation in the 1990s and even to protect and to rescue the new democratic from falling into the conservative authoritarian setback. And finally, finally, to prevent the external authoritarian China factor from distorting Taiwan's democratic future. Therefore, number seven, the last clarification, the possible, the possible link as seen in Taiwan's case can be understood in the following. Progressive, yeah, okay. Progressive new middle class having taken part in advocacy pro democracy, democracy civil society organization, having then actively engaged in various phases of a democracy, either in initiation, transition, consolidation, or even rescuing of democracy in Taiwan in the past 50 years. Lessons. Only three. Number one, simply to have a large number of a rising upward affluent 
new middle class or middle class will not be enough to rest to secure democratization. It is necessary to have adequate, I only say adequate number of a liberal and progressive new middle class intellectuals and professors and professionals to envision the protest, the, the prospect of democracy either under authoritarian or during demo, dem, uh, democratizing democratization process. Number two, again, simply having a sizable, ordinary, non-governmental civic organization may not be sufficient, won't do the job. It is required to have adequate number, uh, again, adequate number of diverse adv advocacy and pro-democracy social movement organizations to exert pressures collectively again on the authoritarian regime for progressive change to take place. Last, moreover, it is necessary to have the presence of any or any effective political opposition party to challenge directly the authoritarian rule so that the progressive middle class can render, can give their political support while the advocacy civil society organization can further develop or forge a strategic, strategic democratic coalition with it through post-democratization electoral political process. Thank you very much.